So let me introduce Rob Everett, who's Chief Executive of the Financial Markets Authority. Rob um, has talked about the fact that financial service providers are in the privileged position of looking after other people's money um, and helping them achieve their future goals. We know that so many financial uh, decisions depend on trust. What can you do as the regulator to help overcome people's distrust of financial service providers, advisors and institutions? Yeah, um, I think that's a very fair question. I think as everyone in the room will know, uh, globally, it's not a pretty picture uh, in terms of the levels of trust in, in financial services. Um, you've had a series of bank failures. Uh, in New Zealand, we had the finance company collapses. You've had mis-selling scandals across the world, um, and they're still going on, obviously, with the Wells Fargo situation in the US. Uh, you've had benchmark rigging. Um, you know, so uh, it's a pretty damaging picture. So uh, restoring trust is not going to be easy, uh, and it's not going to be quick. Um, I think it's interesting that there was a recent, uh, maybe not that recent, six, nine months ago survey in the US looking at uh, trust in brands, and um, anyone under the age of about 50 um, had significantly more trust in Google or Apple than, than they did in their bank. Uh, and the financial services sector as a whole was down with real estate agents and journalists as the least trusted professions. Um, oh, harsh. So ap ap <laughs> apologies to any current or former journalists in the room. Um, but that, that gives you a sense of the scale of what we're dealing with here. This isn't something that's going to be changed in a couple of years or a couple of months. Uh, it's also not something that regulators can fix by just chucking rules at the problem and chucking a few people in jail. Um, and so here in New Zealand, um, the FMA was set up, uh, the Financial Markets Conduct Act, which is our main piece of legislation, was, was passed with a view to uh, raising standards in the financial services industry as a whole, raising confidence that people can participate in those markets without being ripped off. Uh, and so that's a new regime. Uh, we're in the early years of it. Uh, and I think one of the most important things for us in trying to get to that trust element is knowing that we as the regulator have to work with both the providers and the investors to make sure on both sides of that equation, uh, people are doing what they need to do to get more confident that financial services um, is a good thing and that it will deliver them um, what they need. And how do you keep the providers honest? I'm tempted to answer that by saying with a shotgun. Um, <laughs> <laughs> obviously, we like to use some softer powers as well. I mean, I, 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 guess, I guess the first issue the point I would make, which I know everyone in this room gets, um, but I think it is worth repeating uh, every time we, we confront that particular issue um, of how you go about doing this, which is financial services is different, right? And some of the sales practices that um, have caused the most issue, yes, you do see those sales practices in other industries, um, but actually uh, that can't be the case in financial services. The, the decisions people are making the products they're buying, uh, the investments they're making are quite often life uh, transforming decisions. They're, they're decisions that are going to influence their, their wealth in retirement, um, what they can afford to give their children. And that's different to buying a car or a kettle or a phone. So um, on the one hand, the providers need to adjust how they sell, uh, what they tell people about the risks of the products. On the other hand, too, the people buying those products and services need to look at it as a lifelong decision, not a, not a momentary decision. So I think it's always worth uh, making that point. Um, it's also worth making the point that um, today, uh, investment decisions are complicated for everybody, right? None of this is simple. If it was simple, we wouldn't be having these problems. Um, the world got really complicated, and it's very intimidating for a lot of people to make these decisions. Um, and just uh, relying um, even inadvertently on customer ignorance, customer apathy, inertia, that isn't good enough for financial services. It can't, it can't find itself in the position where it contributes to those bad decisions. So I think that framing is quite important in terms of the how. Mm. Um, so obviously for us, as a conduct regulator, uh, first time in the securities and markets regime, um, we've had something in New Zealand that would be described as a conduct regulator. Um, you know, for us, it's partly about licensing. So in New Zealand, we brought in a reasonably uh, extensive licensing regime, which hadn't existed before. Uh, and obviously, part of the benefit for us in that is to assess people on the way in, to make sure that we think they're bringing the right 
approaches, the right controls, the right governance to selling financial services. Uh, it also gives us an ongoing relationship with those licensed entities. So it gives us the ability to monitor, uh, to check, uh, to have constant conversations about what they're doing. I think that's um, incredibly important. And then beyond licensing, because perhaps somewhat ironically, actually, we don't license banks or insurers, so the, the, the kind of mainstream, if you like, of financial services um, doesn't sit with us. Um, but more generally, we're trying to have a conversation around conduct. You know, a lot of uh, securities regulators now call themselves conduct regulators. Everyone talks about conduct risk. We're all talking about outcomes for consumers. So it's really trying to um, explain what, from our perspective, we think that means, what it means the providers should be doing, you know, all the way back to uh, tone from the top and culture and all of those sort of difficult issues around financial services. Um, and it also means working with investors to try and get them confident that they should ask questions and they should spend time researching, they should get advice, they should get help, um, and they shouldn't be scared to be demanding of their, of their providers. So um, it's, it, for us, it's working on both sides of that equation. So talking about the investors, we called this, um, this session how the finance industry and its regulators could help you talk to your future self. Yeah. What, how does the regulator help investors uh, to make better de <coughs> excuse me, decisions yeah. for their future? Um, so it's, I think it's partially about confidence. Um, it's about habit. Um, it's about um, encouraging, I think, investors to take accountability for the decisions they make um, whilst encouraging them that uh, if bad things go on, if misconduct happens, if bad sales practices result in them being sold something that clearly wasn't appropriate for them, that someone's watching and then someone's going to take action. So I think um, it's about encouraging people that um, the decisions they make now will have an impact in years to come. And the earlier you make those decisions, uh, the, generally speaking, the better those outcomes. So it's getting people into a frame of mind that says, I should spend more time on worrying about my financial planning and my investments than I should about the next phone that I buy or the next TV that I buy. And I think we all know that's difficult, right? Because those are all very seductive things. Um, the advertising is enormous. Um, but actually, for most people, if you put it into a New Zealand context, for instance, whether they decide to be in the KiwiSaver scheme or not, and what sort of fund they decide to be in, actually are going to have a much bigger impact on their life than pretty much anything else other than health that they're looking at. So I, I think it's, it's through the media, it's through the providers, it's through the regulators, it's through all the government agencies. Um, it's getting people to acknowledge that there are decisions to be made and that if you make them when you're 25 or 30, uh, it's going to be a lot better for you than if you make them at 55 and 60. Uh, and I do think the, the Kiwi Saver Scheme uh, is beginning to be big enough that it's actually forcing some New Zealanders to ask themselves some harder questions. So, yeah, it's about habit and it's about confidence um, and it's about making people understand that uh, there is some accountability for their own financial planning and that, you know, if I think of some of the countries represented in this room, I think a common theme is going to be in the next 20 or 30 years, um, governments trying to get citizens to make decisions for their financial future, to make their planning, to have the freedom and the opportunity to make those decisions without being told what to do by the government, and still trying to have a balance of a safety net provided by the government for those who don't have the income to make those decisions. So it's encouraging people not just to wait until someone tells them what to do, but actually go and ask a lot of questions. You talked about confidence and knowledge and so on, but it's also about sustainable behaviour change. What's your role in that? What can you do to, to uh, support that? Yeah, so, I mean, we regulators like to think we can change the world, but um, the reality is, um, in this space, uh, throwing regulations at this, having a regulator, um, you know, even one as good-looking as me, um, Telling everybody what they need to do, it just doesn't work. Even right? in a Mr. Incredible outfit? Even in a, well, they'll, it might work, you could try. <laughs> they'll certainly pay attention to my superhero outfit. Whether they listen to anything I'm saying is a different issue. <laughs> um, so, so the regulators um, really can't change this. I mean, they, we, we at the FMA, and I think most of the regulators that, that we would regard as peers, genuinely believe we can influence this and we can make a difference, but we can't change it on our own. So it does require an all of government approach. So you know, we work very closely with the CFFC. We work very closely with other arms of the government. Uh, we also work very closely with a lot of providers 
to try and make sure there's a concerted uh, attack on this because the changes in financial literacy and investor confidence that are needed uh, are going to be incremental, right? They're going to be small, and it's going to take decades uh, to raise those standards. And so it requires real commitment from the government, I think, um, and I think it requires equal commitment from the industry uh, not to take advantage of the confidence gaps and the information gaps. So uh, it requires a lot of work, um, and it requires... Uh, and I think New Zealand is modelling some good stuff here. Um, it requires the government agencies to be talking to each other because all of this is connected, right? All the way up from education in schools, all the way up to people at retirement who, who may well be well-educated and actually might be quite well off, but they're still being asked to make decisions about their future that may be beyond them in terms of financial planning. And so it's about how, how they get advice, where they get information, and working on the whole spectrum, not just one piece of it. And what about the providers, the financial service providers? What about sustainable behavior change from them? Yeah, well, I mean, it's absolutely critical. Um, none of the pain of the last 10 years um, and all the regulation that has followed it um, will have been worth it if in 10 years of time we're having mis-selling scandals and people are feeling let down by their providers again. Um, it will question what the regulators have been doing it will question whether the, the money that's been imposed on the industry to change standards has been worth what you're doing. So I think that one comes down to the cultural sea change, which I, I hope is underway, where the providers understand they have to take real responsibility for how they engage with their customers. And, and the fact that a customer is willing to buy something does not indicate that it's necessarily a good or worthwhile product or a good value product for that customer. And that's why I made the point at the beginning that this isn't about selling iPhones, right? This is not something where as long as someone's willing to spend $1,000 on an iPhone, that's a good trade and everyone's happy. Um, it's a different level of engagement and the providers have got to think harder about where the customers benefit and why that product is being sold to that customer, why that service is being given to that customer, and ask themselves, you know, does this work? Is it fit for purpose? Is it going to deliver good outcomes, we think, for that customer, or actually don't we care? And, and if you look at um, the worst pieces of the mis-selling scandals, look at the UK um, issues around the pay payment protection insurance, um, you can easily get the impression that the industry actually didn't care whether that product worked for people as long as they bought it. And the only measure of success was the share price. And I think um, the financial services industry uh, needs to set itself different goals in terms of what success is that can't just be based on profit and the share price. Uh, and you would hope the last 10 years have started to change that. Um, but my guess would be we're still a long way from, from really what a, a successful outcome would be. Mm. You're from the UK. You've worked in Europe, Asia, and North America, I believe. So who's winning, do you think, when it comes to uh, saving effectively for the future and the regulations that they've got in place to, to help people get there? Yeah. Well, New Zealand, obviously. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, well, um, look, um, in terms of some of the savings habits and investment habits that we, we talked about, um, different countries take different approaches to how they incentivize or, incentivize or disincentivize certain areas of, of investment and savings. So, for instance, the UK, I think, quite successfully um, gave tax breaks on certain types of investment products, ISAs and PEPs, um, and also tax disincentives on uh, investing in property, for instance, um, with capital gains tax on second properties. So, um, different things work in different jurisdictions. Um, I think in New Zealand... Um, uh, KiwiSaver has been a massive feature of the landscape for the, for the last few years. Um, it remains to be seen what it will look like in 30 or 40, but certainly as a way of encouraging that habit of saving and encouraging uh, people to look at that mechanism and start to ask questions about investment. So, okay, that's not just a saving. It's not a bank deposit. It's actually invested in something. What's it invested in? Why is it invested in that? You know, what are the returns I might expect? What are the fees I'm paying? You know, we are beginning to see um, what you might describe as the slumbering giants of the New Zealand public beginning to awake around KiwiSaver and start to ask 
those quite demanding questions which need to be asked if you're going to invest rather than just hand your money to, to a bank to effectively put under the mattress. So I think um, every jurisdiction has struggled with the balance between government protection and investor choice. I think you see that in different ways. I think every jurisdiction has struggled with um, what a good financial advice sector looks like, um, what standards do you impose, how do you curate uh, very broad access to relatively affordable, relatively straightforward advice. Um, so I think, you know, I don't see any particular winners or losers, but um, I do see here in New Zealand, as the balances in KiwiSaver um, go up, uh, we're at that tipping point now where I think both the media and the public are beginning to look at that and think, actually, this is quite a lot of money that, that I'm hopefully re receiving as a return and quite a lot of money that I'm paying out in fees. You know, maybe I should pay more attention. And, and I think, I think getting people to pay attention and not just assume that at 55 or 65 or whatever the retirement age, someone is just going to hand them 30 or 40 years worth of um, uh, living income. I think that's an important mindset uh, globally that people need to get into. Mm, subject close to our hearts at the Commission, that one. Yeah. Um, talking of other jurisdictions, do you think, uh, how well do we learn in New Zealand from other jurisdictions and take, take on board what they are doing and, and adopt it ourselves? Could we do better at that? Well, um, I think New Zealand, New Zealand's a very cosmopolitan society, as, as you and I both know. A lot of people here who either weren't born here or their parents weren't born here. I think it does um, create a certain open-minded approach to the way things are done in different jurisdictions. Uh, and of course, New Zealand's a small country, We've only got four and a half million people. Um, so the amount of money available to do things for the first time or do things from scratch uh, is quite limited. So we do pay a lot of attention here uh, particularly to those jurisdictions that have a similar uh, setup to New Zealand in terms of the regulation from our perspective, so a conduct regulator separated from a prudential regulator. So we look at Australia, we look at the UK, we spend a lot of time looking at other um, countries in Asia to see how they're um, handling it. Um, the US is probably less of a model, um, incredibly complicated setup, different set of dynamics operating in the US. So um, whilst we might learn from some of the mistakes, uh, the market that we're dealing with, you know, just isn't comparable. So I think, um, I think we do a pretty good job, actually, of, of trying to learn from mistakes. Uh, but, it, you know, financial advice is a, is a good example. Um, you know, the UK had a right old crack at this and has started to rewind most of what it did. Um, the Australians had several bites at this. Uh, we're in at least our second bite, certainly in the last, um, last five or ten years. Um, that's a really complicated area which needs to be tailored to the dynamics of the market and the population it's delivering to. So just copying another jurisdiction, just, you know, that would be really thoughtless and I think it would fail. Um, but we can see uh, in some of the other jurisdictions, some of the areas that um, have been tried and have gone wrong, or some of the things that have gone wrong in the industry that haven't been properly covered by the regulators, uh, and we can learn and hopefully close those gaps. Mm. So finally, how does New Zealand, New Zealand stack up in general when it comes to people as they approach, approach retirement? How do you think we're doing? Helping them reach, reach that yeah, moment in well, the position? Well, the FMA and the CFFC have done a fair amount of surveys around this. Um, not well enough is the answer. Yeah. Um, in that, uh, still, people's willingness to make quite difficult, laborious decisions and analysis about their future you know, it's still limited. There's still a lot of people admitting that they haven't planned for their retirement, that they haven't actually added up what superannuation, KiwiSaver, and anything else they've got will do for them. And I think the, 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 the online tools that the CFFC has done so much work on um, will encourage people to at least start thinking about that. Um, but that's the, that's the main thing we have to change. We have to, we have to get people um, willing to spend time on really boring financial stuff and to get help for those pieces of it, which for a lot of people will be most of it, that they don't really understand themselves or don't feel they have access to the right information. And so it's a combination of, of encouraging people to, to make the effort whilst acknowledging it's hard, it's intimidating, and it can be overwhelming, and to go and get help. Lovely. Rob Everett, thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you.